<laughs> so good morning, everyone. It's the first slide. Um, and so my name is Amy Luters. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the state director for the Bureau of Land Management here in Nevada. And I appreciate the opportunity to always get to visit with all of you at the TRIRAC where once a year all of the resource advisory council members come together. So I really appreciate it. And I wanted to start with this slide. Um, and I've lost my prop already and I'm going to get in trouble for stepping outside of the box by art. I know it. Um, so um, these pictures here are from the calendar that we put together that all of you have on your desk. And this was a photo contest that we had um, in terms of people putting together pictures of the public lands in celebration of Nevada's sesquicentennial, which uh, the state and we are celebrating uh, this year. And so I think this is, does a great job of really recognizing the diversity of the public lands that we manage here in Nevada and in many ways, a, a reflection of the Resource Advisory Councils, of the diverse interest and backgrounds that you all bring that really match the diversity of the lands that we manage. And so I hope you will enjoy this, and it will remind you of why we are all in this in terms of the public land issues. The next. So, I appreciate that everyone came a long way. We have people that have made a, a long trip to get here, and I appreciate all the time, and uh, particularly for all of you, all of the time that you volunteer to help advise us on these very complicated issues that we have in managing the lands for the public. So I wanted to spend a little time talking about kind of some of the priorities and my vision for the BLM uh, for 2014. And, and for me, in terms of how we make decisions and what we work on, these are the kind of goals and visions that guide me and the team that I have. And so it's leaving the resources better than we found them. We should be judging our actions against that. Um, think big and manage across broad landscapes. And that requires us to work with our neighbors and look across state lines and, and work with many other folks because the landscapes don't know a district boundary or public land, BLM managed lands. And so it's very important that we think big, that we're going to make courageous decisions wisely. We're not going to be the generation that kicks hard decisions down the road. Um, we're going to tackle those difficult issues uh, because we have the right folks and the folks of the RAC to help us advise us on those decisions. And then lastly, ensure our processes are efficient, transparent, and consistent. It's important to me that we look to do things the best way that we look about not adding additional hurdles. And it's important for our customers and our stakeholders that regardless of where they are, those processes are consistent. So that's a big issue for me also. So I'm going to talk about some of these pr programs. We're going to talk about fire, minerals, grazing, drought, tortoise, you can read them. Uh, some of these will be talked in more detail when Raul comes up after me. So I'll just kind of give a highlight of these issues. So in 2013, I'd say we had a good fire season. And good to me means not many acres. And so you'll notice on BLM, less than 100,000 acres uh, burned in 2013. And across Nevada, significantly lower than the previous year. Um, I think we were both good and lucky. Uh, we have a tremendously dedicated and well-trained fire staff. Uh, we have done a lot of work in terms of pre-positioning resources and ensuring we have resources in the right place at the right time. And we were also fortunate this year to not have a lot of those large fire bus multiple start days. So on minerals, it's uh, probably no surprise to any of you, uh, we have the largest mining program in the Bureau of Land Management. And I think Nevada represents about half of the entire Bureau's workload in minerals. Um, we have more than half of, uh, nearly half of the Bureau's mining claims. We have near more than $2 billion in bonds that we hold to ensure that we are not leaving a long-term liability for future generations to deal with. Uh, we have a very large sand and gravel program, and we're continuing to use our mine permitting team to, to have more consistency and efficiency in permitting operations. And, it's important that we are both consistent and efficient, but also that the outcome leads to um, projects that are not, um, that are environmentally sound. So that's some of the important pieces of the mine permitting review team. 
Uh, certainly the very history of Nevada, and we are celebrating its 150th year of statehood this year. Um, mining is a very big part of that history. With that history comes the historical issue of abandoned mine lands. We have the largest program in the agency. We have a tremendous partnerships in place to address this and really have done an amazing job of inventorying sites and most importantly closing sites to ensure that we are not creating health and safety issues. Um, certainly I know probably the Northeast Rack has spent time this year talking about oil and gas. We are not what uh, we call in Nevada one of the OPEC states or one of the large oil and gas producing states as a matter of fact or one of the lowest oil and gas producing states in the country. We do have four lease sales a year. We have generated in 2012 over $11 million from lease sales and rentals. And I think everyone's aware there is a new interest in Elko County oil and gas exploration. Um, in renewable energy, um, we did have the solar programmatic environmental impact statement that was signed in 2012. These established solar energy zones, which were areas where uh, the potential for solar was high and the resource conflicts were low and really were about putting renewable energy in the best places in terms of having economic value but having low environmental impacts. We have five solar energy zones in Nevada and we've been doing quite a lot with them. Uh, we were the first to develop the Dry Lake Solar Energy Mitigation Plan. That was the first mitigation plan done for a solar energy zone. Um, we are now working on one for Dry Lake North in terms of the mitigation plan. We are also going to be looking this year at having a competitive process within the Dry Lake Solar Energy Zone. We have a lot of interest in that zone and making that available for uh, competition. Um, we have a number of projects ongoing, um, five solar projects, one wind project, two geothermal projects. And I think what we saw this year was we really started to see sort of demand flattening out, and that was largely driven by the market. Um, I think people, California sort of said we've got enough for now, um, and so people were trying to figure out the market piece, couldn't get power purchase agreements, and as a result, couldn't get financing. We are starting to see this year a little uptick in terms of interest on renewable energy, I think largely driven by the legislation that was passed in the last legislative session uh, that will lead to additional uh, demand within Nevada for renewable energy. So we're starting to see a little uptick, um, which I think aligns really perfectly with our work in the Dry Lake says. Did you skip two? Okay. Uh, so in BLM Nevada, we have 663 grazing authorizations. Uh, some of the priorities for us are renewing grazing permits, assessing rangeland health, um, ensuring that grazing use is in accordance with the rangeland health standards, and developing a statewide permit renewal issuance process. Uh, certainly for us, we have not been sort of keeping up where we want to be in terms of the permit renewal. And as I said, we want to make sure we have consistent and efficient processes. So one of the areas we've been focusing this year is just that. How do we have additional accomplishments and how do we do that in a more consistent and efficient way? Uh, we pay the state about $200,000 a year in grazing receipts and here are some of our accomplishments for 2013. Um, it's certainly no surprise to anyone who drove here or anyone who lives in Nevada, uh, drought is an ongoing issue for us across the state. Um, we're in the third year of significant drought um, and you'll certainly be hearing more about drought from Raul in his presentation, really I think giving you a good context of where we're at relative to past years and how significant this issue is for this state. Um, we're continuing to, it's certainly one of our focal areas this year because of the severity and continuance of drought. Uh, we've been focused on monitoring range conditions, uh, working with permittees to identify voluntary actions, and you'll see uh, we really had great um, partnership with our permittees this past year in terms of taking voluntary 
non-use. And certainly making sure that we are educating people about drought and what it means. Uh, we did last year kind of identify and develop a kind of an outreach strategy, our, our plans and what steps we were going to take. So people, we had a very transparent and consistent process in how we were addressing drought across the state. Um, for, for those in the south, uh, desert tortoise continues to be a big issue for us. In 2014, uh, two of our priorities are going to be to use the best available science, and it really has been a lot of, I think, evolution in terms of the science that is available to us to make decisions that affect the tortoise, uh, particularly its habitat, and particularly connectivity issues, which I think we didn't um, have a, as much information on in the past and is a really important issue for us. And then our second one is to work with partners to develop a strategy to cease taking um, unwanted captive tortoise um, into the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center that we manage in Southern Nevada. And we're working in partnership with many of our federal and state agencies and nonprofits on that. If you haven't heard of Sage Rest, where have you been? So uh, it is certainly a big issue for many of the folks across the West, across the range, and certainly here within Nevada, a lot of folks have invested a lot of energy uh, working on sage grouse. Uh, clearly one of the important things that we've been working on is our plan amendment. I certainly appreciate the comments that we received from both the Northeast and Northwest RAC in terms of that were submitted during the public comment period. And I appreciate the investment of time that you put into uh, preparing those for us. Um, it did close on January 29th. We received over 15,000 comments. Clearly a number of those were form letters, but we received really a lot of substantive, uh, deep comments that we are currently working through. So that is gonna be one of our focuses, is pulling that together. We've been working very closely with the state and the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council as they have continued to revise and refine the state's plan. And so there's certainly a lot going on, uh, both at the planning level, but also at kind of the project level, and I think some of our challenges will be once we get the planning effort done, as hard as it is, the implementation part will be even harder. And certainly an area, I think, where the RAC can help guide us in terms of our priorities as we implement wherever we end up with the land use plan. We also had the bi-state plan amendment that we did also in cooperation with the Forest Service. Um, that affects both the Carson City and Tonopah offices. Um, the Forest Service took, is taking the lead on that plan amendment. The public comment period closed on that draft, and we received about 170 comments. Uh, we really are at a pivotal moment, I think, within Nevada in terms of our land use planning efforts. And I don't think there's ever been a time where we have had so much of the state undergoing plan revisions. And it is a really important place for the RAC and also the public to engage because we are fundamentally defining what public land management looks like on probably half of the state right now. And so what, that, what land management looks like on those public lands for the next 10 to 20 years is something that you all have an opportunity to be a part of. Um, and it's a huge amount of work as we look I know the Northwest RAC was engaged in the Winnemucca RMP. We are very close to having uh, the protest resolutions, I, I hope, um, on that. Um, we, we are also working on the Las Vegas, Battle Mountain, and Carson City RMP. So that's a really significant part of the state that impacts all three RACs. So it's a really tremendous opportunity, and getting it right is really important because, as I said, it really defines what public land management looks like for the next couple decades. And then there's something, we have a lot to be proud of. Um, we have a lot to be proud of in terms of the work of BLM employees, in terms of the partners that we have. And so we're really, I wanted to highlight just a few of them. There's so many. Uh, one is completing the draft EIS for Sage House. That was a huge lift. It uh, took the investment of a lot of people's time. And certainly our work's not done, but getting to that milestone was very significant. We opened the seed warehouse in Ely, and I think uh, Rosie and her team, what a tremendous asset to have. We're so fortunate to be able to have that here in Nevada. And really, and it's part of a 
a, a national strategy that allows us to have more flexibility and more capacity to address not just our fire restoration needs, but more proactive restoration work. And so it really increases our flexibility as a bureau and increases our flexibility um, here within Nevada. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we had a Battle Mountain and our partners with UNR Co-op Extension win the Secretary's Conservation Award for the Bootstraps Program. It is a tremendous program uh, that Rod Davis heads out of UNR Co-op Extension that not only gets terrific work done on the ground, but really provides opportunities and life skills for at-risk youth. And I'm very, very proud to be uh, part of that program. Uh, we also have the Vegas Valley hand crew, Veteran Hand Crew in Southern Nevada. Uh, we were the first state within BLM to stand up a Veteran Hand Crew. For those of you who haven't met them, they are a tremendous bunch of veterans who do tremendous work for us across the nation. Uh, they this year won the Pulaski Award, which is an interagency fire award for teamwork, and I can't think of a more deserving bunch uh, to receive that award. Everywhere they go, uh, they get glowing reviews in terms of the hard work and the great work that they do, and it's a tremendous, I really encourage you to visit with them and uh, what a great opportunity it provides for them and for us. And then we also completed the supplemental EIS for the Ruby Pipeline. I know many in the Northwest were involved in the Ruby project, and we continue to ensure not only that we've done the SEIS, but to ensure the reclamation um, is occurring on the ground. So those are just a quick overview of some of the things we have going on. Hopefully, maybe I might give you some thoughts in terms of things as you do your breakout over the next day and a half of areas where you might want to focus and some of the things that I'm particularly proud of and that I hope we can be tackling in the coming year. So any questions for me before I turn it to Raul? I'll go with uh, Megan then here. I think you need, we need to make sure you have a mic. It's kind of a specific question, but out of the 11.3 million that you guys received in oil and gas for 2013, how much stayed within the state and does any money stay within the districts of the sale? So I think, is it half, Gary? So half, it's half goes, of what we receive, half goes to the state. To your office and then how do you- No, no, to the state of Nevada. And then the other half just goes to the treasury? Goes to, tre yeah, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Walk over, grab the mic. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm seeing on the internet that a number of organizations have posted that the uh, sage grouse comments have been extended to uh, February 15th. Is that correct? No. So, so I think the f um, so, so uh, uh, there's been a lot. Uh, there's a lot of dates going on. Uh, so I think the February 15th is the Fish and Wildlife Service comments on the bi-state proposed listing decision. Do I have that right, Raul? Yeah. The 10th? Okay, so February 10th. So the date that was extended was Fish and Wildlife Service's comment period on the proposed decision to list the bi-state population as threatened. Any other questions before I turn it to Raul? Okay, well, I look forward to visiting with you over the next day and a half. I will be here uh, until we conclude tomorrow. So I look forward to catching up with uh, those of you I've met before and those that I haven't. So thanks, thanks everyone for coming. I look forward to having a good day and a half. That would be perfect. And, um, and again, just a I don't need this. Do I? Just a reminder to when we ask questions to get a mic uh, so the folks online can hear. So how do you want to do introductions? So we just start. Uh, we can just start and then just pass the mic to anybody. Okay. I guess I'll do this. <laughs> Tom Conley, Northeast Rack, representing grazing. Jeff White, Chair, Northeast Rack, representing energy and minerals. Kevin Lee, Northeast Rack, uh, Transportation Right-of-Way. 
Julie Hughes, Northeast Rec, um, Dispersed Recreation. Larry Heislip, Northeast Rec, uh, Environment. Dave Pierce, Northeast Rec, Energy and Minerals. Jack Pryor, Northeast Rack, uh, Environment and Wildlife. Jeannie Nations, Wild Horses and Burrows, Northeastern Rack. Doug Furtado, District Manager, Battle Mountain District. David Meisner, representing Academia. Tanya Reynolds, Native American Interests. Good morning, Lori Carson, representing elected officials, uh, Northeastern Rack. Good morning, I'm Jill Sylvie. I'm the Elko District Manager for BLM. Good morning, Rosie Thomas. Um, I was the designated federal official last year with the MOSO and the incoming designated federal official for Northeast Rack, so I'm really not a trader. And uh, District Manager, Ely District. Megan Brown, representing Congressman Mark Amity. Stretch Baker with Mojave Southern Rack. Mike Herter, Associate District Manager, Ely District, recently traded to the Moso Rack. <laughs> Tim Smith, District Manager, Southern Nevada, and the designated federal official for the Moso Rack. Jason Higgins, Moso Rack Chair, Energy and Mineral Development. Robert Adams, uh, Moso Rack, uh, representing organized recreation. Tim Coward, Field Manager for the Tonopah Field Office. Mark Smith, Southern District Office, Southern Nevada District Office. Hillary Patton, Rack Coordinator for MOSO. Good morning, Lisa Ross, Carson City District. Leslie Ellis Waters, and I'm the Rack Coordinator for Northeastern Rack. Uh, good morning, my name is Lucas Singvoldstad, I'm with Senator Reed's office. Good morning, Gary Johnson, Deputy State Director for Minerals. Erica Slozik, Communications Chief, BLM Nevada. Everybody's going to see me. Um, my name's Kurt Kuznicki, nominee for the Southern Nevada RAC. Ron Cherry, representing public at large, uh, Sierra Front RAC. Ray Hendricks, uh, Sierra Front RAC, representing grazing. Uh, Willie Molini, Sierra Front RAC, representing wildlife. Andy Hart, Sierra Front RAC, representing recreation. Tim Dufferina, Sierra Front, uh, grazing. Debbie Lassiter, Sierra Front Chair, representing Energy and Minerals. Doug Hogan, Sierra Front RAC, Academia, Great Basin College. David Von Sagern, uh, Sierra Front RAC, representing Environment. Mark Free, Sierra Front RAC, representing State Agency. Uh, Craig Young on the Sierra Front, of course. Uh, cultural resources and historical resources. Good morning, I'm Bernadette Lovato. I'm the Carson City District Manager and it's my first tri rack so I'm looking forward to meeting more of the RAC members and uh, it's really good to see the Sierra Front Northwestern RAC members here. Good morning, Matt Gendrich, um, Sierra Front RAC representing right away in transportation. Jackie Anderson uh, taking notes. <laughs> Samuel Crampton, Senator Dean Heller. All right, that was very good. So good morning, everyone. My name is Raul Morales. I am the Deputy State Director for Resources, Lands, and Planning in the Nevada State Office. And um, I've been here a couple times talking to you about similar projects, similar, oh, I'm on. Thank you. Um, these, uh, these issues I'm going to talk about, I've talked to you guys about in the past, and so um, some of it's going to be familiar, but it's going to be more updated because we are a year further down the road. So I've got four topics, I'm going to say droughts of two, greater and bi-state, but we're going to go through drought, horses, and say droughts. I do have a question period after each topic, and I know we got an hour, so we'll just kind of monitor that and just kind of, Chris, maybe you can help me out with that, make sure I don't spend too much time on one topic and of course, I'll be around throughout the course of the day, so if there's additional questions, that would be great. So, so drought, before we hit the first slide, let's talk about the good news of drought. One, two, three. It's 
precipitation in Nevada. Okay, yay. So we are getting some snow and it looks like we are getting some rain. So that's good, right? We'll take any kind of moisture we can get. Now let's talk about the big story. So why has it been so dry here in Nevada and across the West? And in uh, weatherman's terms, we have this big dome shield because of high pressure centered over the West. And what this dome shield is doing is it's forcing storms to go over to the north or stay out to the coast where they dissipate. And I've been watching the weather. Our friends to the central, uh, central United States and eastern United States have been taking the brunt of this dome. And uh, it's been really tough on them. And we've been basically experiencing dry, mild winter so far this year. So some of the current events, uh, recent current events, in January here this year, 2014, uh, NRCS uh, it said that we have a limited water supply predicted for the western United States. Uh, NOAA Prediction Center calls for a milder and somewhat drier winter. Also in 2014, all counties in Nevada were declared emergency, and, um, which makes them eligible for drought assistance. And in addition, basically most of the western states are also in similar conditions at this point in time, even including Hawaii. Recent article in the New York Times this week predicted that this is going to be the worst drought in 500 years in the United States. <clears throat> Coming close to home, it was in a paper this week. Uh, there's only one spot in northeast Nevada that's registering 100% uh, um, percent of average snowpack this year. And is that the Corus Can Coral Canyon that's at that 100%? Did you remember that in the paper? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and then you can see the rest of the information right there about the Waihe River, the Humboldt River, uh, definitely well below 100% this time of the year. Um, Nevada is entering the third year of drought. We are in the third year of drought. So it's going to be a very tough year. And we know the livestock operators and others are going to have to make some very difficult decisions about what to do with their operations this year. And we know it's going to have a huge financial impact on them. All right, so this is a map here of the United States. The red and the brown basically show those counties within those states that are what we call declared um, by the USDA as emergencies, meaning that operators in those counties are eligible for some form of financial assistance to aid in that. And in this case in Nevada, both the red and the yellow, two different designations, one's called the primary drought, and the other are contiguous counties under drought emergency all it means is there's different emergency aid under both of those categories, but um, basically the whole state of Nevada falls in that category. There you can see Hawaii, oops, back there, where you can see the droughts. Looks like Kauai, if you want to visit a non-drought island, Kauai is the place to go. Um, <clears throat> this map I just want to show kind of a picture across the west. Um, obviously you can see the dark red blob. Uh, which is the extreme and exceptional droughts um, in California and Nevada. You can see the extreme and exceptional drought categories across the other states in the West. I wanted to particularly draw your attention to both Oklahoma and Kansas. That's because it'll relate to my horse discussion a little later. Can you see? Sorry, step back. <laughs> um, those are where we have a lot of our long-term holding uh, facilities for our horses. And so those folks that are taking care of the horses out there are also experiencing drought conditions, which is affecting horses out there too. So I said we're in a third straight year of drought. Over the past six years, Nevada has had five drought years out of six. <clears throat> so this isn't anything new for us, but what is new for us is the past two years have really been in that extreme and exceptional category. What that means to the vegetative community that we're responsible for the management for is a lot of stress on those plants. And those, so those plants are not in a healthy condition. And we have a lot of animals, whether it's livestock, horses, or wildlife, that are dependent on that vegetation for their survival. And so we have that responsibility to make sure that we are managing those uh, vegetative resources properly. And obviously in a drought, it's tough for everyone. So highlighting the past two years, this year, last time I showed you the picture of the map on the left-hand side. Um, this is where we currently are on the right-hand side. The big point I want to point to you here is that in what I'm considering the really bad condition, 
the severe, extreme, and the exceptional droughts, we are right now at 80% of the state is in that category. Last year, we had 56% in the state in that category. If you look at the worst one, the exceptional, we had 0% last year, we're at 5% this year. So <clears throat> we can't spin it. It is what it is, but it's just not looking really good. This map is just kind of a breakdown of the counties that fit within those drought categories. Um, the exceptional, the extreme, uh, the severe, and I do, that's the uh, moderate or I don't even pay attention to that one because it's not really big. What is that called anymore? Moderate condition. It's kind of amazing again that Las Vegas is in the moderate condition class. It just seems something's weird. Next. <clears throat> so here's the uh, drought outlook between now and April of 2014. Um, you'll see last year at this time, and more attention to the brown here, which is the drought to persist or intensify. Last year, that's what we looked like. Of course, Nevada was in a tough shape last year. This year, we're a little worse off, but in particular, what I really I caught my attention is up here, the wet states are in a drought drying condition. That's where we get a lot of our moisture from. So it's not coming in, that dome has set up and it's preventing even Washington and Oregon from being wetter than they usually are. So what have we done over the past year? Um, I think many of you know we have completed drought management EAs in all of our offices, uh, except Elko. Elko is in the process of completing theirs. Their draft uh, drought EA just went out a couple of days ago for a two-week comment period, so they will be done soon. Um, <clears throat> we know that drought's not fair, but we do, BLM does have to proactively respond to drought. And we have to do what's right for the land and the vegetation. And as Amy said, some of those things, we have to leave the landscape in better shape than we did and that we have to make courageous decisions. We in Nevada are leading out on what we think we need to do proactively to address the droughts, to protect our resources for the long term. Um, last year, we got a lot of voluntary non-use from our livestock operators. I want to applaud those individuals that did that. And I'll show a little slide here of what happened last year with that, which was really good. Unfortunately, we did have to issue nine decisions to permittees who did not want to take their cattle off or adjust accordingly to take care of the drought issues. And as Amy said, that we will continue to protect the resources and that we will continue seeking voluntary non-use this year. That's imperative. And I know all of our districts have sent out drought letters to all of the permittees already this year alerting them. We will be looking again for voluntary non-use, but we will have to issue decisions if necessary. So this slide, just the difference uh, the past year, basically. Um, in particular, right here, the grazing allotments with very voluntary non-use, we had 41 in 2012. Over the past year, 2013, we went up to 245. I really applaud that effort. That's really great. I know a lot of people are out there very interested in taking care of their rangelands for future use, so that was really good to see. Um, <clears throat> Voluntary acres of reductions went from 2.2 to 17 million acres across the state. And um, basically HMAs um, were also monitored. Uh, sage grouse areas were also a priority for monitoring. Uh, both her, uh, horse management areas and sage grouse areas will be a priority this year again as we monitor our rangelands. The other point I want to make out as it relates to sage grouse is um, as far as some of the really complicating factors that drought's posing for us is that when Fish and Wildlife Service makes their listing decision on the bird, how BLM addresses droughts is gonna be looked at very heavily. And in particular, we know we're gonna go to litigation on the sage grouse plan, and when it goes before a judge, that issue will come up before the judge. So we need to be able to show that we have been proactive. And when I say we, it's all of us collectively, really. Um, it's not just BLM. All of that voluntary non-use, I think, is really positive to show what folks, our stakeholders are doing to help deal with the drought issue. But we can't ignore droughts, and we have to consider that in relation to, say, droughts. So what else are we going to be doing about drought this year? As I mentioned, we'll continue voluntary non-use requests to permittees. Uh, monitoring is going to be a high priority for our BLM uh, field offices this year on drought. Um, 
We will issue range decisions as necessary. Um, wild horse and burrow monitoring flights to assess animal and rangeland health will be a priority this year. Um, outreach and education on drought will be ongoing, uh, and a lot of agencies are doing the outreach on drought, so it's not just BLM. So we're taking it very seriously, and other agencies are taking it seriously as it relates to their mission. So any questions on drought? Uh, what drought, pro what are you guys doing practically for the sage grouse relative to drought? I mean, the, a permanent solution? Or so, okay, I'll just, so the question is, what are we proactively doing for sage grouse as it relates to droughts? Um, well, basically how we're addressing livestock grazing, for one thing, um, from the vegetation standpoint and the riparian areas, our spring meadows and everything, very important to birds. When the hens have their chicks, they start heading for water in meadows. So we're definitely looking at protecting those areas. Um, horses, you know, uh, that's a, I'll talk about a little bit more about that in the past. That truly is a challenge for us. Um, but at this point, you know, we, want to, we have set up some in our RMP, land use plan, the EIS effort, sage grouse standards, land health standards that will kind of complement our rangeland health standards that we've used. So we're adding that into the equation. That will be part of the future as far as what we need to look at. Um, those are some of the big things. Anything else locally that anyone else is doing for sage grouse? from the BLM? Did I hit it? If I hit it, that's good. Okay. Right. Any other questions? I'm just going to keep this mic because you know I'm all not, <laughs> I'm not very shy. Um, so you talked about some of the drought in relation to other programs that you have in the Midwest for holding for horses. So obviously those are contracts and you guys can't um, move them to other places. So are you guys going to be supplementing the contracts to ha uh, pay for additional costs for hay or other things that you guys are? And if you are, where is that money coming from in the budget? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. So the question is long-term holding facilities in the Midwest for horses. What are we dealing, how are we dealing with the needs to take care of those horses um, as it relates to drought, forage, and or the budget for it? Um, what we've been hearing over the past couple years from those uh, contractors that have the horses on there is that um, their forage bank, their native grasses out there are being hurt by the droughts. They're just not growing like they used to. And that they're having to supplemental feed more with hay than they have in the past. And as a result of the drought, the hay costs have really gone up. And so we're at a, t a point where a lot of those long-term holding contracts are coming up for renewal here in the month of March. Um, we're, you know, we're going out for proposals also to solicit additional long-term holding capacity issues. We'll, I guess we'll get a feel for the costs this go around on the contracts based on drought, based on cost of hay, based on interest to continue having horses in the facility. What we're hearing is the uh, cattle prices are such that um, some may decide they don't want to do horses and want to go into cattle. So these are things we are hearing at this point, and we will know more come March what costs will be and what the desire to stay with horses will be. And our budget for this year uh, basically is equivalent to last year's budget, but a good chunk, 60% plus or minus of that budget does, does go to the care and feeding of horses in long-term facilities. So it, it is putting a strain on our budget at this point. Hi. I was just wondering if you have any uh, roundup scheduled for the year uh, 2014 because of the drought. So I'll, I'll talk about that when I get into horses next. Okay. I'll answer your question there. <laughs> All right. Okay. Getting ahead. <laughs> any other drought related questions? All right. We'll go into horses. <clears throat> All right, so just a snapshot of where we're at with our horse populations at this point. Uh, nationally, 37,000 horses um, on our public lands. Uh, Nevada, we're estimating between 22 and 25,000 horses. Their appropriate management level nationally is around 26,000 horses. 
Uh, for Nevada, we're about 12,600 animals as the appropriate management level. So you can see we're about double where we believe we should be and what the range can support. 84% uh, of Nevada's HMAs are at or above AML at this point. Um, and 70 of the 83 HMAs are approximately double AML. Um, I believe I mentioned to you guys before, wild horse and borough populations double approximately every four years. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be watching closely this year, since we are in the third year of drought, is, is, the, is the full crop going to be lower this year as a result of limited resources. Last year, I thought we might see some of that, but it, what I'm hearing from the field folks is that our full crop was kind of average for last year. So want to watch that and see that. I know in wild animals, a lot of times when the uh, environment gets tough, we typically have reduced, uh, whether it's eggs laid, animals born, animals surviving. So we'll see how that works for horses this year. So what we removed last year, 2013 nationally, we removed 4,200 horses. Uh, Nevada removed 27, 2,800 of those horses. Uh, we treated about 509 mares, uh, 46 in Nevada. We adopted out 2,300 animals, 89 of them in Nevada. And we didn't have any sales um, in Nevada last year. So as a result of the drought, what we're noticing is wild horses and burros are moving outside their HMAs, um, trying to find water and forage. Um, we're seeing animals moving as much as 30 miles away from their HMAs. And we've also noticing this year that we're seeing some horses on their summer ranges already. National Academy of Science report, I think I reported to you last year, we were waiting for this report. It was done and completed, uh, delivered to BLM uh, late this summer. Uh, BLM put a team of folks together to review the National Academy of Science reports. Uh, so we have a kind of a report uh, of, of our response to the NAS reports. It should be out soon, I'm told. We haven't seen it yet, at least I haven't seen it. Um, but, um, you know, they have a lot of recommendations on that report to BLM, and I know one of their recommendations was that they did believe BLM was underestimating the number of horses out on our public lands. So this year, we are going to be applying the survey method um, that was uh, requested or suggested in the NAS reports. So we'll get an idea uh, this year how our counts have been in the past in relation to this new survey method that we'll be doing. Um, you know, one of the other things, big parts of the report is that they were encouraging BLM to continue, continue to work on partnerships across the local communities, a variety of partners in helping us develop where we need to go with the horses. And so that, that'll be a big part that we'll be looking at. And one of the other parts is, uh, part of the report is that uh, population control was heavily discussed and that the uh, Bureau of Land Management is gonna go out for a request for proposal to help us deal with the population control. We're really hoping to target the pharmaceutical companies. Um, some of the other methods that we've been doing, the uh, one-year PCP uh, treatments and the five-year treatments. The one-year treatments has been very um, sporadic as far as its effectiveness. Got to do it at the right time. Um, the five-year treatment at this point, early tests uh, are not conclusive that we can get a five-year uh, treatments on the mares. So we're looking at going out to the pharmaceutical companies to see if, if there is some help there that they can provide us with coming up with some different tools to help control uh, population growth on the range. Again, just a drought map with uh, the herd management areas in the state of Nevada. Um, Basically, a majority of the HMAs are in the severe to exceptional drought categories. And as I mentioned in the drought uh, discussion, monitoring of HMAs in relation to drought is going to be a high priority for us. Of course, a lot of those HMAs are also within sage drought country, so it'll be um, you know, monitoring both of them. So, you know, having this map helps us. It's going to be beneficial for us to kind of prioritize our management actions as we move forward. So what is BLM doing about the horses nationally? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to develop looking at new techniques for treating horses on the range to try to control growth. Uh, we'll continue partnership with the USGS to improve that inventory method, the county method that I mentioned earlier. Um, 
we're going to be looking at how to determine a, a, an ecologically sustainable horses on rangelands. I mean, if we truly, well, we're above AML right now nationally. Um, as it turns out, if it turns out we are underestimating, I think we have a lot of work to make sure to see if we can actually sustain those animals on the range that we currently have. Um, Adoption program, adoptions have been low the past few years. Um, a lot of, you know, the economy's been tough. You know, you need some land. Uh, price of hay is high. Those are probably all figured into low adoptions. Um, but we do think nationally we need to do a better job marketing uh, horses for adoptions. So we're going to be looking at that. And I'll talk about that from what Nevada is going to do here in a second. And nationally, they are exploring other opportunities with U.S. aid to maybe help adopt uh, horses outside of the United States. Uh, we also have a um, comprehensive animal welfare policy uh, that will be released very soon this year. Basically, that is bas uh, um, tells us how we should be treating animals when we're doing gathers. Um, again, so for assuring the health of the horses is taken into account as we do our gathers. Oh, one other thing I want to say besides USA, if you go, did you go back, yeah, is one of the other areas we're really exploring is trying to get more prisons interested in training horses like we have in Carson City and they have in Colorado. We're, we're finding that um, those prison trained horses, when we adopt them out, they go really fast. So people seem to like horses that are already trained versus taking the wild animals. So really exploring getting more horses into prisons across particularly the east and the south to try to bolster that opportunity for getting trained horses out to the public. So as far as Nevada, um, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're figuring out how to deal with limited to no gathers. So, so your question for 2014, at this point, because of budgets, because of the fact our long-term holding capacities are filled up, our short-term, mid-term -term, um, holding facilities are filled up, we don't have opportunities for doing big gathers. So we're looking at how do we address safety, you know, horses that are on the road, horses that are entering private ground, uh, horses that are providing a public nuisance. You know, that's a small number of horses. You know, we're hoping we can at least place those horses into a facility if we can't adopt those horses out, then we're going to try to adopt those horses out. That, at this point, based on our budget, based on our long-term and short-term holding capacity issues, is probably the best we'll be able to do as far as actually removing horses off of the range as we know it today. Could change, but that's what we know today. Um, water hauling, another big, touchy topic. Um, you know, we, it's expensive. Costs a lot of money to haul water. And if we're just hauling water with no real reason to haul water. In other words, is there has to be a bridge if we're hauling water for a reason to get horses from point A to point B. So whether it's a turn in the uh, climate or, um, you know, something that's going to allow them to survive, you know, that makes sense to us. But we don't have a big budget to do that everywhere. And we're anticipating with drought, that's going to be a real challenge for us this year. We're also going to work with our stakeholders. Um, so whether it's permittees or others who might be interested in hauling water, we're exploring those options right now to see if we can't do that. So um, we just met last week. We called it our Wild Horse Summit in Nevada, um, where we talked about all these issues and about where we want to go. And so that was a topic we talked about is watering horses. What can we do? Who can help out with that? What is the goal if we were water a horse? I mean, if it doesn't really get us anywhere, you know, we, we're talking about what does that mean? What does that look like? What should we do? Um, we know. There'll be a lot of interested people who don't want to see horses dying, starving on the range. Um, why aren't we watering horses? It's, you know, it's, it's going to be a very emotional issue for sure. But we are confined by budgets. Um, we're discussing how to deal, we'll dis you know, how to deal with when we see declining animal health or declining rangeland health. Um, we're going to be talking about what we need to do, what actions we need to do when we spot that this year. So that's going to be a big thing for us. Um, and uh, due to the droughts and budget and holding capacity, like I said, we will be having to make some very tough choices without very good options. Um, so we're, we're really not in a good place in Nevada. I just, I want to leave you with that, with horses. We're just not in a good place. And it's like, I liken it to a plate of food that you have on it, and there's nothing really good in that plate. And you're kind of looking at it and said, what do I do, you know? 
Um, you're going to have to eat something, and it's just not going to be what you like. So we, we're expecting a tough year for horses this year. I'll almost there, and then we'll go to the questions. <laughs> um, Eco sanctuaries. Uh, so talked a little bit about that last year. So we do have three other states. They're all on private ground, Montana, Wyoming, New Mexico, where we're looking at eco sanctuaries. The total holding capacity for those three areas, assuming they come on board, is 900 horses. Uh, the Save America's, Save America's Mustangs eco sanctuary here is south of Elko. We just got a letter here about uh, a month ago from Sam saying that they wanted to withdraw from the EIS process. We are in a process of getting ready to send them a letter asking them, are they sure they want to withdraw from this process? So at, that, at this point, our ELCO office is kind of in a holding pattern as far as moving forward with that eco-sanctuary uh, until we hear back from them, um, you know, to make sure that they really want to stop. Okay, questions? I got a question. I don't even know if you know uh, the the slaughterhouse in New Mexico. It's on. It's off. It's on. It's off. And it, it, there are people that have old horses that they wish they could, <coughs> you know, just get rid of, and maybe they'd want an, a new horse. And I mean, if if they're taking old crippled horses that are just hanging around, and they're able to make dog food or or find textured burgers or whatever. And then uh, that opens up people that want adoption. But I, I, do you have any information on what's going on with that down there? Just what I'm hearing in the news, too. You know, it's just very controversial. Um, Congress didn't approve any funding for that facility. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's still up and running or trying to get up and running or if it's been put on hold. And the old horses, like you were saying, were private horses, people's old private horses. Yeah. Right. Yep. I was wondering if we could get more volunteers possibly out on the HMAs where the wild horses are. I volunteer er quite often where I live. I'm close to the Antelope Valley herd, HMA. And I have to say, those horses are in great shape in spite of the drought and everything else, and they have plenty of water. I see to it that the water troughs are you know, flowing. And so our area is in good shape, actually, at this time, anyway. So no, so thank you for bringing that up. I, I'm hoping that when you get into your RAC subgroups, I mean, as far as what can you do to help, um, if you guys could talk about watering options, is there, you know, how can you help out us, help us think about what things we can consider about watering animals? I know I've had a couple of folks come up to me saying, on my private ground, I'm willing to take horses. Um, that's great. I think you just need to think about the cost of taking a horse. It's kind of like our long-term holding facilities. You know, it costs almost like about dollar thirty a day to feed and care for one horse. You know, so, but if those are options um, that you guys want to talk about, BLM would definitely entertain those ideas. So, um, I really hope when you when you break out in your rec subgroups, spend some time on thinking about what ideas you can give us to consider. If you have ideas on options for adoptions, we're interested in that. We are forming as part of the Nevada team. We are for, uh, forming a, a small a committee of folks from the various offices to look at what we believe is a better way, to hopefully, to market adoptions of the Nevada horses. We're looking at getting other people outside the BLM engaged in that committee. So if there are folks on the rack who would like to be part of that committee to help figure out how we can increase adoption of horses, we welcome that, too. So and if, you're, if that's the case, you'll let Amy and I know tomorrow or whenever you have that discussion. Over here and then over here. Back there. Okay. okay. And just a question. Okay. okay, go ahead. Go here. Let's go here, here, and I'll go to the back. All right. Okay. So how do you reconcile the two statements that have been made this morning? One, making courageous decisions, and the second one, not gathering any horses from overstocked HMAs? Good. All right. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> and we have been saying that, we have been seeing this issue coming for the past couple of years that where facilities were getting full and as and I think the year before I showed you the gather from 2012 last year's numbers were 2013 very small percentage of numbers and 2014 we are basically faced with a limited gathering issue from Nevada's standpoint <clears throat> we can't 
Our ability to affect the change on that is harder, you know, because we don't control that in Nevada. That's at the national level. And trust us, our national folks are truly aware of this. Um, and we've been pushing very hard that we've got to address this issue. We've got to take care of this issue. Um, we've gone out at the Washington national level for requests for proposals for additional holding capacities, facilities. But because of the drought, no one has bid. We haven't gotten any interests. Um, so we, I mean, so we're trying, <laughs> trust us, we are really trying to do that. And the budget has been limiting to us from that standpoint because 60% of our budget right now is definitely cost to hold those animals. We're trying to figure out ways how we can get animals out of the facilities. So if we can get them into those prisons, freeze up some space, but we're also trying to get animals out of facilities to reduce our costs, that 60% long-term holding costs of the animals so that we can do more proactive things on the range. So it's, it's a conundrum. If we don't have any space to put animals, it's eating our budget. If we can get some of those animals to some other place, then we'll reduce the uh, budget to do on, you know, on range stuff, but we can't replace the animals we remove with other animals to put it back in because then it defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do as far as reduce cost. So it's, it's very tough. It's very tough. I got one over here and I'm gonna go back here and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, one of your uh, remarks, you know, or uh, goals was to determine how many horses are uh, ecologically sustainable on Western ranges. Okay, we have HMAs now. We have AMLs that were set up. So supposedly this scientific stuff was done in the past. Now, are you proposing to increase the size of HMAs or go outside of the boundaries of HMAs t in your study? Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't have not seen the Bureau's response to the NAS reports at this time, but I know they've addressed that. Um, I would say going beyond the HMA is going to require land use plan amendments if we have to do that to get public comments. So, uh, subsequently, if we're going to reduce our HMAs areas for horses, we're going to have to do a land use plan. I think that's one of the things they're talking about in Washington is do we do a programmatic EIS to talk about HMAs and what that appropriate management level should be for horses at this point. And I think our budget will, will weigh in heavily as far as where we, where we can go with um, the horses on how many and how little. But then, then the only thing you're going to be using for a management tool in the interim period is a decrease of domestic stock on ranges to, to make up the difference, right? To protect the rangelands? No, and protect yourselves from having to be responsible enough to take the excess horses off as well. So, yes, it's easier. It is truly easier for us to work with the permittees and, hey, have, have your cattle removed at a certain time or adjust a grazing cycle or whatever. Definitely easier for that. Again, because of the long term, we have no place to put the horses. That's our big conundrum. That's our, where we really have no good places to go. We just, that, I mean, I'm honest with you on this. We don't have a place to put horses at this point in time. Okay, then uh, if I could... Uh, one of, one of the other comments was that you're uh, with a declining number of animals in range health. Now, what animals numbers are declining? And it can't be the horses. You just told us that they go up by 25% uh, a year. So we're talking about, you know, as far as right now, you know, some of the horses we've seen are, seem to be in good body condition. So we're talking about over the course of the year as the drought and the forage and the water start disappearing, we anticipate seeing horses getting into the leaner body conditions. And then we'll have to address what do we do with those horses? Because once they get into that condition, you know, the horses are either going to die on their own, make it through until hopefully we get some forage or water. And those are the tough decisions we're going to have to ask. Do we, what do we do humanely with those animals that will suffer at that point? Does that answer your question? Uh, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> all right, less. Well, well, that's the answer I wanted. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> Rahul, I'm really going to step out there. Um, as you say that there's no more room, it's on the taxpayers back in regards to funding. Um, making the hard decisions, um, Department of Interior, it is a political, uh, you know, it is a, it is a fire starter big time. But I'm going to step out there and when you talk about I don't, I don't know if there is a humane way so far as a, a slaughterhouse. Um, if it, it can be somewhat 
and, and I think it could be, uh, economically viable if there was a slaughter facility and, and, you know, and monitored the way it should be monitored. But we have an opportunity, the U.S. has an opportunity so far as exporting to third world countries where there's a need for food. In other um, European countries, it, uh, it is, you know, served in restaurants. But it's a political firebed. And that's where, you know, when the rubber meets the road, those tough decisions have to be made. It cannot continue the way that it is. And, and I know it's not popular. I know that there's lawsuits. Take New Mexico. It's off. It's on. But it has to, these decisions have to be made by the Department of Interior and because it's, it's on the taxpayer's back. And it's not working. So it, it, food for thought, and I know that that's probably not very popular. Um, I, no, pun, no pun intended. I apologize. No pun intended. But, you know, and even uh, talking to uh, Tanya so far as solver nations, whether or not if they have the ability to get started with something like that. Um, anyhow. I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with everything you say. We know it's a tough one. Um, and I, I believe this will be a year where we'll probably see more action than we've had in the past years. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to require more than just the Department of Interior to wrestle with this at the end of the day. Um, I can't say, Absolutely. And I can't say what I, what I found out over the past year is that our, our sovereign nations actually have more horses on their range than we do on public range. So I was really surprised to hear that to the tune of maybe 100,000 horses on uh, um, native lands. So let me, I need to go over here first and I see what you're doing. You're kind of getting up and you're moving. <laughs> we're, gonna run out of we're gonna run out of chairs up here quickly. So was there a question? Ron. Rubel, um, yeah. if I understood that one um, slide right, it showed that it, there was only 46 horses fertility control, uh, given fertility control last year? In Nevada. In Nevada. Well, knowing that uh, there's no holding facilities to put them in and uh, that the numbers are doubling every four years. How come there isn't more fertility control being done? And is there any plan to do any more? <clears throat> yeah, we, we, well, no, there's definitely a plan. That's one of the one of the NS reports recommendations. And I know Washington is like all over that trying to figure out. That's why we're putting out that proposal. Hopefully get the pharmaceutical companies to come up with a drug that'll be more uh, persistent over time than what we had had in the past. And so, like I said, those tools that we've had in the past just haven't to this date brought us the effectiveness that we've been looking for. Um, you know, PCB is good on small herds where you can actually get to them easy and actually treat them. But in the case of Nevada, where we've got wide ranging herd, big numbers, I don't think it's quite as effective on those herds because we just can't get to them and treat them. So in Nevada's case, we focused on removing horses as much as we could last year versus treating animals. And so, but now we don't have that option to remove. And as far as treating animals, uh, PCP, this is the time to do it right now, the winter time. You know, if we do it in the summertime, we're just wasting time. That's what we know is not effective. So it's a small window, and it still requires money to do that. It still takes a helicopter, uh, bait and trap kind of techniques to bring animals in in order to treat them, which kind of gets into our budget question. Here and then here. Come, come. Okay. Uh, back to a far simpler question to address is the, the temporary watering. Uh, join the drought, which will hopefully end soon, that uh, if um, the citizens were provided would say troughs that they could take out and put in the range and uh, a couple tanks that would fit in the back of a pickup uh, could be kept at a town office or something like that, that uh, uh, people could check out for a week or so. That uh, I, I, I know that citizens would step up. Uh, people have asked me about things like this, about uh, our town providing the troughs and the tanks. And we just don't have the budget, but uh, if the BLM could provide us with those tanks and troughs, we, we get them out to citizens. And uh, uh, the, as far as this year, that, that watering problem would be solved. And, and this is, that's a good comment to bring up in your breakout sessions about kind of figuring how can we do that? You know, who provides what? Who would actually do it? What are, what are funding uh, constraints associated with that? Um, and our BLM managers can help talk about any other issues that might 
need to be addressed in order to do that. Right, but the that, volunteers. That's what we want to hear. Volunteers would do it. It's simply a matter of the troughs and the tanks. Appreciate that. Uh, also, there's not going to be any emergency gathers. So is that correct? There's there. If we had do emergency gathers, it's going to be for public health and safety, um, nuisance animals, kind of animals going on a private oh, ground. Okay, the ones you're talking about. Yep. Okay, so I'm I'm I'm. Uh, I'm going the other way with Larry's thing about the courage. It's going to take a lot of courage to deal with the public outcry, the massive drought, and all the dead horses. So is there some budget set aside for a guy that's going to do nothing but explain this to the public? Because there's going to kind of have to be. Yeah, I mean, no, it's our. It's going to come to a. Oh, yeah. Uh, we definitely, no, part of our summit last week, we talked about the outreach, the public communications plan. We know this is going to be big. Um, we're, we want to make sure our Washington office folks are aware of what we're going to do in Nevada. We've told our Washington office folks that Nevada can't wait. We've got to act. We've got to do things. We're going to give them every opportunity to say, here's what we're going to do. Um, but don't study it forever. <laughs> We've got to take some action here. And we delivered that message last week, and they heard us. And, um, you know, it, that's why I said this, you know, the outreach internally as well as externally is just going to be a big big challenge for us. Okay, Megan, and then over here, and then over here. And uh, just one, let me do a quick check. Okay. Oh, Megan first, thank you. Um, two questions. One, you talked about priority of, of possible removal was dealing with either drought, safety issues as far as highways, and then infringement on private property. Is that, does that include other private property rights like water and those sorts of things? As it relates to horses? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that's a good question. I, okay, be, I'll follow up with you next week on yeah, that. Yeah, because we got a lot of water, right? There's a lot of private water out there. Yeah. And we got a lot of horses. <coughs> We're going to have to prioritize. Okay. We're going to have to prioritize. I'll follow up with you next week okay. on that so you, can, you and Alan can talk about that. And then one other question is relation to volunteer watering and that sort of stuff, which I think is great. I mean, again, that's another issue of whose water are they pumping to put in the troughs? Is it something from town that the t municipalities is donating in a truck or do they own the water rights and those sorts of things? So, I'd just like to, to put it to the tri rack here today. If the three racks together would like to make a statement to the BLM about this policy of, of no gathers. <laughs> I, I think it'd be a very powerful statement if, if all three racks in Nevada made a statement about uh, not having any gathers. That it's, that it's a, a cowardly decision rather than a courageous oh, I won't go along with that because I want nature to take the <laughs> oh. Did you guys finish your discussion yeah. over there? All right. I know if someone you put you put a proposal to the group here and maybe you'll talk about it at your uh, Okay, your breakout sessions. Okay, so I know, where, did, where was I left off? Was I over here? Well, well I just, yeah. if, to follow up on that okay. suggestion, which, which is a positive suggestion, if it would help you at, in budget allocation at the DC level, then I, I would certainly be supporting, a, uh, support doing that. If it wouldn't, then, then I'm not sure what good it would do. I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a cowardly decision. I think they're in a, a real bind, and I understand that. But if if the three racks could send a letter to the BLM director, I guess we've got to go through the state director. But saying, you know, just supporting that you get some funding to to address a dire situation. Yeah, I mean, I th I th definitely think there's value to it. I mean, if you don't say anything, then they'll say, hey, well, we never heard anything from you guys, right? So I think there's value to putting it in paper and and, and seeing where it goes. So. I think it's a good discussion, personally. 
Yeah, Raul, I know there's been a, a lawsuit, Nevada Farm Bureau, Nevada Association of Counties. Can you explain where that is and where the process is going to go, how long it might take? Are you familiar with that? Yep. So we got the lawsuit filed on uh, December 30th. Right now, um, our lawyers are looking at it right now and, and preparing a response to it. But the nexus of the lawsuit really was um, BLM, you're not following the act. You know, you need to be following the act. You need to take care of the animals. Um, it did point out clearly, you know, you, when you remove horses from the range, you either sell them, you adopt them, but it says there's nowhere in the act that says you should be paying for long-term holding facilities like we've been doing with the act. So basically what they're saying is that you should put those animals down if you can't sell them or you can't adopt them. Um, you know, and of course the impacts to the rangeland and the wildlife and the private lands and all that stuff was part of it. But, you know, in a nutshell, they want us to follow the act. And uh, so like I said, our solicitors are just kind of looking at that right now and, and preparing the, the response. Do you know what the time frame? how this thing's gonna roll out? No, I don't What's at this point. I, d I just know they got it in their hands, they're looking at it, and however lawyers do their stuff. Okay, Yeah. and I had one follow-up question. Yeah. Um, say come April, the long-term holding facilities, those contracts haven't been renewed, mm -hmm. and you're short. Mm -hmm. What are some of the options BLM may be faced with? <clears throat> good question, very good question. Um, you know, I've been talking to Amy, I says, you know, Washington definitely needs to discuss with the, the budget that we have this year, what do we do in case some folks decide not to renew their contract? Um, what are we going to do? Um, that will be a, definitely a topic of discussion at the executive leadership team meeting in March about what are our options at this point. But we all recognize that as being a, a big, big issue. Uh, I just want to, as far as Holland water goes and stuff, I, I want to also say that if you're going to move these horses to outside their HMAs, in other words, you're looking for more feed, that's why you're hauling water to them, and you're get, you just want to be really careful that you're just scattering horses. Yeah, and, and we, know. that's, yeah, that's a good point you're bringing up. That's not our intent. We really don't want to do that because, you know, the horses aren't supposed to be out there in the first place. Um, but those are also be that case-by-case -case situation. We have to look at what those horses are doing. I mean, can't we even put them back in the HMA? You know, does water do anything if there's no forage? That's what, that's why I'm saying the whole watering piece is tricky. There has to be a bridge, you know, ideally, you know, you get them from point A to point B. So once they get to point B, they're good. If you're just taking care of it and there's no outcome at the end, those are some of the tough choices we're gonna have to make as far as then why are we watering it? Is it to feel good that we're watering the animals? The impact of watering the animals and putting them in areas where there's forage outside, if there is forage, outside the HMA in another spot, it obviously impacts private land users in that area that didn't have to deal with horses in the first place. So we want to be very uh, cognizant of, of how we water horses. Right, because we're in, as a grazing, we're already in enough, enough bad shape. Exactly. I don't, we don't need you moving horses to us. Agreed. I mean, right. outside where they're supposed to be already. So I can go talk sage grouse for the rest of my time here a little bit. I'm not sure that'll quite generate nearly as much <laughs> as the horses, or if there's still more horses, we can go with that. I think the sage grouse might be fairly quick. I think we're kind of up on that, but. Okay. What is your coordination with other agencies like US Fish and Wildlife Service with regards to ESA species and wild horse gathering? Are they supporting your efforts? as far as trying to maintain healthy ecosystems or how is that working? <clears throat> yes, yeah, so Fish and Wildlife Service, and that's, um, I know their comments they provided to us on our draft for the Sage Grouse EIS, did talk about horses and our ability to take care of horses. So they're very concerned about um, BLM's ability to manage horses within our AML level. Uh, so they are very supportive of whatever options we can to address this issue. Okay, with that, let's just go right into sage grouse and then we'll see where we're at. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about greater sage grouse and then roll right into bi-state and then we can open it up in uh, for questions. Um, just a quick uh, picture of the land use plans that are going to be amended by the sage grouse planning effort here in Nevada and Northeast California. Um, time frames. Um, as you guys know, the uh, comment period closed Jer January 29th for Nevada's, uh, California's, Utah's, and Idaho, Montana's. Oregon's is still open until February 20th. 
Uh, we look at or having a proposed RMP completed by the summer, this summer, uh, with the goal of records of decisions being signed by this fall. That will then give Fish and Wildlife Service their time necessary that they need to take a look at our plans and evaluate whether or not to list the bird or not. Oh, and I should just mention the Rocky Mountain states are kind of on a similar time frame, um, and this this kind of this is a big coordinated effort to kind of get these plants uh, together so Fish and Wildlife Service can cumulatively take a look at all the state's plans and assess the impacts of those plans to the meeting the goal of keeping the bird and its habitat healthy. Um, as mentioned earlier, we had 15,000 comments on the Nevada uh, California plan. 97% uh, were form letters. Um, we are in the process of beginning that analyzation of the responses uh, of the form of comments that we got. We're hoping to have that completed by April. And the comments from the RACs will be reviewed. And if we have any questions, we will definitely be following up with you guys for clarification. So I do want to thank the RAC for their efforts in the past, not only in providing comments to the plan, but also help developing those sage grouse standards that we put into the plan. So thank you very much for that. A little bit about the governor's alternative. As you know, it's one of the six alternative in our draft EIS. Um, uh, the state's updated portions of their state plan. We continue to engage uh, the governor's team in um, uh, ironing out some of the issues under their alternative. That's been very good. We're getting very close to having a lot of um, agreements on where things need to be from the analysis standpoint of the plan. So we're meeting basically you know, twice per month with them uh, to address topics. Um, we're already getting clarification on the credit co conservation, the mitigation credit system. Um, we're getting cr uh, cl further clarification on what it does it mean to avoid, minimize, and mitigate in their plan. So that effort is really going good, and I think it's been very positive. Um, we have recently completed a sage grouse map with USGS's help, uh, Dr. Pete Coates which further refined the sage-grouse areas in the state of Nevada. Um, the uh, Sagebrush Ecosystem Council of the governor's team basically bought off and approved that map. And BLM will be looking at amending our interim management guidance that we have to use that USGS map. So we'll be looking at um, um, updating our interim guidance and getting that out to our field folks. So uh, we got a few things we're working out with uh, 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 peak coats right now on the map, so, so it's getting close to being in shape. Okay, so next steps, uh, public comment analysis happens, you know, February, probably early April. Uh, response to public comments will be coming out in April. Cooperative agency review will occur in May. Um, I said the final EIS uh, will be July, protest period and governor's consistency will occur during July and August, and a record of decision shooting for September 2014. Uh, again, this is a very aggressive schedule, and um, you know we're really trying to hold to that September 14 date just because Fish and Wildlife Service is telling us they would like a year before they make their proposed listing decision in September of 2015. So engagement from the RAC, um, we will continue to keep you guys updated um, as the EIS process continues over the next few months. I definitely see when we get into the implementation of the plan, a lot of work to be done there. I think you guys have heard me say this in the past, completing the plan is really the easy part. It's the implementation of the plan that's gonna be the challenging part. We need to make sure we start off right. We need to make sure we have processes in place to make sure that what we're doing on the ground are actually having a positive effect. So that's gonna be monitoring. We know there's gonna be folks looking at us and seeing how we're doing and seeing if we're gonna stumble out of the block so they can try to drag us back into court, whether it's BLM or Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so the implementation, in my opinion, is critical. That's where the rubber hits the road and we really need to get off to a good foot. So as we get further along in the planning process and we see how things are going, I do see we'll need help with some form of the implementation. Adaptive management is a kind of a key component in the plan. How do we address new science? How do we adapt based on our monitoring data that we're finding when we do projects on the ground? You know, that's, you know, that's just gonna be something new for us is, you know, we always say adaptive management in general in words, we have to really mean it this time if we're gonna be successful. So to me, that's the next step. So basically, what do we do with the county plans? Um, 
you know, we'll have the consistency check uh, with various county plans. Uh, elements of Elko County plan were incorporated into the agency alternative, as well as the state alternative. I know Raven control has been a big topic, particularly in the county with the predators, the predators. From BLM's perspective, we don't hunt animals, but we can do the mitigation or best management practices on our habitat improvement projects. And that's already kind of standard operating procedure for us. So we have you know, designed, basically put some required design features in there, re-emphasizing that when we do habitat improvement projects, they're gonna make sure that don't encourage ravens or hawks or whatever to come into the area. Um, So some of the other alternatives that we did receive were things like a hunting alternative. Again, beyond Forest Service don't deal with hunting, so it wasn't uh, followed through in the uh, draft plans. Um, Elko County plan mentioned about letting the bird become listed. Uh, we can't do that. That does not meet the purpose and scope of this EIS effort, so that was not forwarded onto uh, the, the draft. Um, A lot of Elko County's plans were already contained in either alternatives A, D, or E. So there is a lot of their stuff in the plan. Um, there was, a, was, there was a, a, a proposal to increase grazing. Again, we don't have any science that says increased grazing is gonna benefit the bird or its habitats. And, and I talked about the predation part. Now, a lot of stuff, in the, you know, particularly ravens, as far as why there's so many ravens, I mean, the state has better control of that, local government has better control of that, whether it's uh, land pits, uh, removing dead animals off of the highway, those aren't BLM action items. So, um, and I know those agencies are aware of those things, so um, that's where I think we'll make a lot of progress on dealing with that. By states, uh, again, just to show you where we're talking about by state, the hash mark, it's basically the California, Nevada state line there. By state are a genetically distinct population of the greater sage -rouse. In other words, they've been isolated from greater sage -rouse populations for a period of time. Um, the common period on the draft by state sage -rouse plan that the Humboldt Tyobi National Forest has the lead on and BLM is a cooperating agency closed on January 17th. Uh, as mentioned earlier when Amy was talking, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has extended their comment period on the proposed listing decision of the bird and identification of critical habitat until February 10th. These are the planning documents that will be uh, um, basically amended by this planning efforts. Basically everything but the Bishop California RMP Resource Management Plan, that plan uh, basically the the conservation measures they have in the plan, Fish and Wildlife Service are saying is adequate at this point, so they're not doing a plan amendment. <clears throat> uh, as mentioned earlier, we had 170 comments on the by state, which surprised me, not that much. But the general themes from those 170 comments centered around range management, OHV restrictions, locatable leasable minerals, livestock grazing, and the economic effects. So next steps, uh, again, we'll be analyzing comments uh, and developing a comprehensive response to the comments. Um, late spring, early summer, the uh, BLM and Fish and Wildlife Service will be completing the plan and then the record of decisions being scheduled for uh, completion this September. We are continuing uh, uh, with working with the local area working group. They have been very instrumental in developing the action plan and helping prioritize those treatments that need to be done within that action plan. Um, their efforts have resulted in a budget that we, Fish and Wildlife Service says that we can get roughly 30 million bucks over the next 10 years to address bi-state actions. That'll be very favorable in, as they go through their listing proposal. Um, <clears throat> and then next slide. So what the executive committee and the agencies are doing, now that we know that figure that Fish and Wildlife Service has kind of said, 30 million over the next 10 years seems like a good place to start from a budget standpoint. We've raised that level up, and that's all agencies, not just BLM, Forest Service, NRCS, to our Washington fo office folks to hopefully secure that budget uh, starting next year. So uh, we kind of raised the flag, this is what it's gonna take. Um, you know, we're gonna continue to leverage funds with our existing partners. There's a lot of private mix in the bi-state country uh, and a lot of important habitat on the private grounds um, that you know, needed for the bi-state. And we've had a lot of willing landowners working with us and we've secured some conservation easements with them. So 
we'll continue to do that. And of course, we'll continue to look at a landscape level approach to how we deal with the bi-state across state lines with that. So any questions, that's it, right? Yep, questions on stage, Ross. So back to the uh, Nevada, Northeast California subregional EIS, you'd indicated there's some 15,000 comments, letters that had been received. Presumably a big chunk of those, or a chunk of those are form letters. letters or check a card kind of things. That aside, it suggests that there's a substantive volume of comments. What mechanisms is the Bureau using with its contractor and the staff involved to ensure that those comments are adequately considered in this analysis period. It just seems like there's an incredible amount of work in a very short period of time. <coughs> and the concern I think exists beyond me that we're just moving stuff through as opposed to considering and analyzing. So, good question. Um, if there's a good news about 15,000 comments and the fact that most of them are form letters, we kind of got it, right? <laughs> if, we, if we give it, if, you know, if it's like 2,000 of them say the same thing, we don't need to look at all 2,000. We got one of them, we can analyze it. I don't know at this point of those 15,000 how much were kind of individual substantive comments, but definitely a much smaller percentage. So that's, that's what we work with. You know, we work with all the different comments that we got. It's not a numbers game but all the different substantive comments that we got and we analyzed that and worked through that. So I was actually surprised it wasn't more than that, honestly. Um, so I think it's very doable, but again, to meet that aggressive schedule, it just means all hands on deck to go through all those comments, individual substantive comments, and make sure we've addressed all of them. So I, I, I do think it's doable. I think on many of the comments that uh, Many citizens simply turned it over to their county governments. Uh, I think the Elko Board, um, an excellent letter, and from my life experience is factual, and, and the recommendations are definitely valid. Um, Tuesday, uh, Nye County declared the raven as a nuisance bird, and or as a nuisance, uh, as a predator on the sage grouse, um, and a step to uh, help stabilize and increase or reduce the threat to the sage grass population. Um, do you consider this a viable um, means of, or a viable remedy? So since um, the Raven is protected by the Migratory Bird Act, that definitely works. They'll be working with Fish and Wildlife Service and, and Dow on that one. Again, from Beyond's perspective, that's just not in our purview from the management perspective. So no doubt, probably Fish and Wildlife Service and, and Dow are probably engaged in talking about that. So that just came out this week? At the Tuesday morning meeting. Okay. Right. Anything else? Raul, just kind of a process question. It, it, from what you just indicated, the record of decision for Nevada, Northeastern California, and surrounding areas w would be fall of this year. Correct. And, and I, th I don't remember exactly, but I think the service is mandated to make their decision sometime in 2015, summer 2015. September 2015. September 2015. Do you know, are they going to look at these distinct areas like Nevada and Northeastern California, they're going to look at the, uh, they have to somehow look at the whole thing because the act says that the animal has to be uh, threatened in all or a significant portion of its range. So do you know if they're going to, I guess, look at them all at the same time or do you know? Yeah, and that's why we want to make sure we get all of our plans, both in the Great Basin states and the Rocky Mountain states, kind of finished close to the same time so that Fish and Wildlife Service can take all of our plans and look at it from the range-wide perspective. Fish has clearly said in the past that all states have to come across with a palatable plan that's going to work. It can't be one state does good and another state does bad. However, they're also letting us say the states that are high on their list that they're watching are Nevada, 
Oregon, Idaho, and Wyoming. Those are the key states that really need to make sure we do a good job with it because that's where the biggest habitat and populations of birds are at at this point. So, so we know the Nevada plan. And, and based on what I'm hearing on the comments from Fish and Wildlife Service on our plan, the Nevada, California one, we did a pretty good job with all our alternative D, but we still have a little more work to do. Anything else? I have one. Oh. So a, a big part of this, I mean, this, this projected date for the um, for the record of decision comes right about with your budgeting time and your new your new year, fiscal right. year. Um, I mean, you, we see all over the place that you don't have a lot of money for a lot of things, and and this is going to require a lot of money, you know, a lot of uh, manpower because if you don't have the monitoring you know, back up for things. I mean, are you having an all hands on deck, you know, <laughs> approach to, you know, going after the budget? I mean, it's gonna be a key component to this because you're not gonna, you know, we're, that's where it's all gonna matter right. once, once this goes through. That's a good point. And I should mention the Fish and Wildlife Service Peace Policy, P-E-C-E. -E. What that policy does is um, the Fish and Wildlife Service has to respond to when they make a listing decision. One, they have to look to see if a plan for a species um, has the adequate regulatory mechanisms. So in our case of the bird, we're talking about these sage grouse CISs. So they're gonna you know, review that, they're gonna provide their comments to make sure the conservation measures and the amount of habitat we're protecting are adequate. So that's check one, right? Check two, and where they've lost, Fish and Wildlife Service has lost lawsuits in the past, is in the past they would say if that plan on paper looked good, and they said, good enough for the bird, we don't need to list it. They've lost lawsuits because of the judges have said, how do you know that plan is gonna be implemented? That's why I say the implementation is really the harder part of this whole thing, which is a budget picture. And so, um, so basically the judges told Fish, you also have to consider the budgetary um, um, resources that are gonna be brought to the table to implementing the plan. So it's a two-step process. The piece is a two-step process. Definitely has been elevated up. Um, definitely needs to, I, mean, I think Fish and Wildlife Service is gonna wanna see a commitment from the agencies in the fiscal year 15 budget towards meeting the plan. So that has definitely been brought to the top. And back in Washington, they're already talking about FY15 and even preliminary some 16 stuff, but definitely 15 is, right, you know, that's what we did in Washington was budget type projections all the time. So. But that's another good comment. If the RAC wanted to address that a little bit, um, I think would be very beneficial. Let's see a hand over here. Good, did I finish on time? Okay. All right, so if there's nothing else, I think we're gonna take a break. How long do you want? Till 10.30? Till 10.30 and we'll talk about recreation related stuff. And you can catch me during break if you have any other questions. Thank you. Yeah.